I don't want to waste your time. This video is all about making the most of the time that you have to make games, no matter if it's full time or just a couple minutes a day. This video will mostly be about all the time saves that I've personally found, so most of these will be in the Unity game engine, but some of these should apply to other game engines. Anyways, be sure to subscribe for more Unity tips and tricks. Also, liking and commenting helps my small channel in the algorithm, so it is really appreciated. But no more wasting time, let's start. These first few tips are related to the most obvious and most frustrating waste of time that anybody who has used Unity has had to deal with, the loading screens. So if you're struggling with loading your project, reloading your scripts, and all that compilation, then try dropping a few thousand dollars on a brand new PC with a top of the line SSD and 4 million gigabytes of DDR19 RAM. But if throwing excessive amounts of money at the issue doesn't really suit you, then I have a few other tips that might really help. First off, whenever you go to click play in Unity, there is always this long delay between you pressing and it going. But you can actually just skip this. On modern versions of Unity, you can just go into the settings and under the editor tab, there is a section called inner play mode settings. Then enable this experimental option and make sure to disable the options under it. Boom. Now whenever you click the play button, it'll play. This does have some drawbacks though. Usually during this loading time, Unity is not only saving your game, which you now need to do manually before going into play mode, but it is also reloading the scene and everything in it to make sure that play mode in the editor is almost exactly equal to what you'll get in the actual build of the game. So basically, if you disable it, you might have some bugs that have to do with the scene not properly resetting. Personally, I use the faster method 99% of the time, especially whenever I'm rapidly iterating or something or debugging something unrelated to the scene. But when I'm bug fixing, I also try turning editor reloading back on occasionally to make sure that this is not the source of the problem. Personally, I think that the convenience and time saving is worth a little bit of extra effort. The other main loading screens that you have to deal with in Unity are when you open the project and when you compile after changing some scripts. Whenever you're opening your project, my main piece of advice is to go on a run or watch a movie or something because that takes forever and there's no real getting around it, especially with 3D games. Unity is a big program and there's just a lot of stuff to load. But with recompiling, you actually do have a few options. You can use assembly definitions, which I already covered slightly before in my last tips and tricks video, but basically they make it so that you only have to recompile parts of your code. They probably aren't worth the effort in smaller projects where it only takes a few seconds to recompile, but for the big ones, they are very important in saving time and keeping your code clean. Here's a link to a video on how to do this. Moving on from these loading screens, I'm going to go over some small things that you can do to replace slow and annoying tasks with easier and faster versions of themselves, or a few ways that you can automate them altogether. First off, animation controllers are slow. Not only are they slow to work with, but they are also pretty bad performance wise. So if you only have one animation for an object that it does continually, then consider just using the legacy animation component. The Unity engine seems to warn against doing it, but it actually is better for performance. Second up, you don't actually have to use the state machine GUI thing if you don't want to. You can do it all manually, and personally, I do it manually for some of my more simple animated characters in my game. The main reason that I'll do it manually is that, for example, with this enemy in my game, it can transition from any animation that it has to any other one at any time. So it doesn't really make sense to make an animation state machine because it would just be a spaghetti of boxes connected to each other. Instead, I just throw all these boxes together in the animator and don't even bother connecting them. And then I crossfade from animations directly in code. This is pretty easy to do already, but I also set up a custom script to make it even easier and smoother to go through, and also added things like holding the states. You can just look at my code here for this stuff. But also TaroDev, who seems to be my favorite guy to mention in these tips and trips videos, has a great video on this and you should watch it. Presets are pretty simple to understand. They're basically some default settings that you can easily apply to textures, sounds, and anything else that you import into your project. Make sure to use these but you can actually make these defaults into default defaults. Uh, let me explain. Go to Edit, Project Settings, Preset Manager, and here you can put in all the default presets that you want. So for a pixel art game, you probably want to import all your assets with a PPU of whatever your tile set grid size is, so 32 in my case. And then also make sure the texture is uncompressed and on point filter. This is kind of a basic tip, but it actually took me forever to find out that this existed. So hopefully it helps somebody who also didn't notice this. But in game development, no matter what engine you are using, the biggest possible waste of time and effort you could have is losing all of your progress. So you should use a source control program to back up your game. I previously suggested using GitHub, but I actually moved to Plastic SCM a little while ago and it's way better. For me, GitHub had the habit of breaking on me every few weeks, and since I'm not proficient in Git or the command line, I just made a new repo and moved everything over and hoped that it never happened again. And of course, it always happened again. 
Plastic SEM, on the other hand, is actually designed for big projects and video games specifically. And transitioning to it was easy and I haven't had any issues with it, so I recommend it for sure. One of the biggest time sinks for game development is definitely an asset creation, especially for people like me who aren't really artists by trade. It can take a while to make all the art that is needed. So I have a few suggestions, and this first one is pretty controversial. In fact, I used to disagree with this practice, but I have been convinced of its legitimacy recently by a fantastic example of it. Kit bashing is the practice of taking pre made asset packs and combining them with some artistry and shaders to create assets for a game. And don't get me wrong, it's hard to get this to work. It really is an art form in itself. If you do it poorly, your game will look like an asset flip, and it will lack any uniqueness and style in its environments. But it's proven to me by Project Feline, which is another devlog series which you really should watch. With enough care and effort, you can create an amazing looking world with kit bashing. But be warned, this is expensive, as you have to buy tons of asset packs. So this technique is probably a bit risky for most developers, but I think that it has led to some of the most impressive environments possible in an indie game. Another alternative to kit bashing and stuff like that could possibly be using AI to create textures and stuff for your game. Now personally, I don't know much about this, and also there's a lot up in the air currently about the legality of AI art generators, so I'd be careful if you're making a game around it, because it's possible that in a few years all of your assets will be in violation of copyright laws. But I think that once properly regulated, this technology will be incredible for independent developers whenever creating all their assets. But moving on, the only other tip I have for speeding up asset creation is simply to try and recycle assets if you can. Especially in animation, as motion is hard to get to look right. So after you get a run cycle done, it is definitely not cheating to use it as a base for your other characters' runs. Personally, I do try to make changes to distinguish the characters. For instance, in my game Project Seaborn, this character Yuri is 1 pixel taller than the first character, and his idle pose is slightly different. And also, in a 3D environment, you really don't need a huge amount of variation of assets, as I got by with only about 5 different rock models in my previous game. It's simply rotating, scaling, and positioning the rocks in geometry got them to look very different from each other. Obviously, if you can, you should make as much unique art as possible if you want your game to look beautiful. But if you don't have the time or team members for that, then just be smart with what you spend your time doing. In my opinion, making a ton of average assets with one or two fantastic standout assets, like a landmark or a nice animation, will likely look better and leave a bigger impact on the player than making a ton of slightly above average assets that take significantly longer to make. Even if you have all the time in the world to work on your game, if you don't actually work on it, you won't get anywhere. So keeping yourself reductive and motivated is difficult and one of the things that I have struggled with most in game development. But I do have a few tips that have helped me in the past. The absolute biggest thing for me has actually been this YouTube channel. Making videos, sharing my game, and getting feedback from people in the comments has been incredible for motivation. I feel like I need to make progress and add interesting things to the game in order to make the videos better. And I think that this slight pressure to perform and the deadlines that come from releasing a devlog every month or so really helps me to be consistent in my work. However, burnout is still an issue, and the amount of distractions that I have around me at all times from my computer, phone, or just wall if I'm that unfocused get in the way. Also, it can be hard to have the energy to continue to work in the afternoon after a day of school, athletics, and homework. Ultimately, it just comes down to having practice staying on task instead of procrastinating to just take scheduled breaks. As for burnout on large projects, I've always remedied this by just having a variety of smaller projects and game jams that I work on to take breaks and explore other skills. Not all these are game development related. A lot of these are actually video essays that I make on this channel, but some of these game jams and little projects also end up as other videos for my channel, so it kind of works out well for me. There are so many tips and tricks for motivation that I have likely missed in this video, and if you have any suggestions or tips of your own on motivation or time management or game development in general, then be sure to post them in the comments. But the last tip I have, and the most important one, is to get off YouTube and work on your game. Just kidding. Not really.